Hey, everyone. Time for a chat. Before we dive back into our latest episode, I've got something that's a little less scary, but just as important to share. Have you all ever felt a chill down your spine, not from fear, but from seeing your health insurance bill or the bewilderment akin to reading a witch's spell when trying to understand your coverage? If you're nodding your head, then let me introduce you to Indie Pop. Indie Pop isn't just another player in the healthcare game. They're the game changers for the independent souls out there. The freelancers, the self-employed artists, and everyone in between who makes up a whopping one-third of our workforce. With over 60 million people facing the frightening challenge of finding affordable, quality healthcare, Indie Pop is the righteous bee buzzing back to this hive equipped with plenty of honey. Now, let's talk about the Indie Pop difference. It's like walking into a room and switching on the light. Suddenly, everything is clear. Now, if you're anything like me, you're sick of navigating through complex networks that change the moment you cross state lines, getting tangled in the web of confusing pricing and elusive coverage, and feeling like a ghost in the system where you feel more like a number and less like an actual living and breathing human. But Indie Pop says nope. No more jump scares of unexpected bank-draining medical bills. This is healthcare that's not out to get you. Imagine an open network that empowers you with the freedom to choose your caretakers. Envision transparent pricing with set rates for major medical needs and hospitalization. And the best part? Savings that could range between 20% to 70% compared to traditional insurance carriers. But what's the catch? Nothing. It's simply healthcare as it should be. Designed for the independent population, tailored to fit your budget and your lifestyle. And because you're a cherished part of this beehive, Indie Pop has conjured up a special offer just for you. Visit info.indiepop.co slash nefarious. That's info.indiepop.co slash n-e-f-a-r-i-o-u-s to learn more and join the revolution of care without all the BS. We will include the link in the episode notes so you can buzz on over to it easy peasy. Indie Pop. It's healthcare that's got your back, not lurking behind it. A nefarious nightmare contains themes that may be explicit or triggering for some. Specific warnings and disclaimers will be mentioned in the show notes. A nefarious nightmare assumes all parties that are mentioned in these cases to be innocent unless proven guilty in a court of law. Listener discretion is strongly advised. You can help us grow the show by leaving us a five-star written review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, or you can join our Patreon for lighthearted bonus content. With this, welcome to Season 6. You've heard us reference Ministry Safe and Abuse Prevention Systems in the past episodes, as Courtney used to work for them. Courtney has always seen Kimberly Norris and Gregory Love as mentors, as in a lot of ways, they have shaped her to be what she is today. Another survivor fighting for justice, showing what compassion looks like, and both of us sharing our platform with victims and survivors impacted by these types of crimes. For today's episode, I'm pleased to announce an interview with Kim because of everything Amanda just said. Kim is unapologetically fierce and compassionate, which is a rare combination in this world. She's been victim-centric and always engages with empathy within the company, which she co-owns with her husband, Gregory Love, both who are lawyers versed in sexual abuse prevention. Kim will give you all insight into what she and her husband does, share some tips to everyone who listens, whether you lead a child-serving organization or are a caregiver or parent to a child, or really just anyone who would love to be involved in some way, whether it's now or in the future. With this, I'm Courtney Fenner. And I'm Amanda Cronin. And A Nefarious Nightmare presents Sexual Abuse Prevention, an interview with Kimberly Norris of Ministry Safe. start by saying this. One in four girls, one in six boys. Let me repeat this. One in four girls 
one in six boys. That's the general statistic in which sexual abuse occurs with children. It is daunting of a statistic because the likelihood of knowing someone or even being someone who has been sexually abused is very high. It's a sad fact in which often these cases go ignored and even more sad that it is oftentimes the child is not believed if they say something. There are so many times where a child is groomed and forced to be silent about actions perpetrated by offenders and it is often discussed. But what about the gatekeepers or parents and caregivers? Did you all know that grooming starts with the gatekeepers? If you did not know that, you are about to find out. Plus, so much more. Now, as you all are probably aware, we are taking a slight break from our normal episodes to introduce you to something of a trailblazer when it comes to sexual abuse prevention. But first, I wanted to hop on here and say a quick thank you to Kimberly Norris, because although I was unable to make the interview, I really want you to know that you have really shaped us both into who we are as true crime podcasters today. It is because of your advocacy, compassion, intelligence, and strength that we know what we know. And our hopes are to help educate others in sexual abuse awareness. Kim, you really are a trailblazer. And as moms, Courtney and I are deeply thankful that your light shines in this dim world where you are helping spread awareness and education in places where it would otherwise never be seen. Courtney and I have learned a lot from you, and now our hope is that our listeners could take a lot away from today's episode too. Without further ado, here is today's interview. Well, hello, everybody. I'm really excited to announce somebody that I consider somewhat of a celebrity in a way, um, y'all have heard me talk about her organization within my own research and in cases in the past, past episodes, things like that. And her name is Kimberly Norris, and she and her husband, Gregory Love, have started this company called Ministry Safe and also Abuse Prevention Systems, which they offer trainings to assist child serving organizations in preventing sexual predators from being employed or volunteers within that situation. And, you know, as you all know, I name drop them quite a bit. Um, I often talk about other true crime podcasters that have mentored me, but there's more than true crime podcasters in a lot of ways. Being employed within this organization has shaped me to be the advocate that I am today. And whether she realizes it or not, uh, Kim has been a mentor to me. So, you know, after two years and some change of doing this podcast, I'm finally introducing you all to her. So welcome, Kim. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. I am so happy you're here. Um, so I know about you, but, you know, our listeners don't. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself? You know, your favorite music, food, places you've traveled, things like that. Uh, so my offices are here in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, the work that I do is pretty much all over the country and to some some limited extent the world because of various missional organizations right um i love country music i like all kinds of music i am addicted to exercise and that's because i like to eat (laughs) so um i'm a preacher's kid so grew up in um young life ministry and uh church ministry and uh yeah, that's kind of my backstory. Nice. I'm married to my law partner, so family fights are fun at our house. <laughs> I can only imagine. Mm-hmm. So you and Greg actually started Ministry Safe as well as Abuse Prevention System. So how long has that been in operation? You know, almost 31 years, um, wow. initially out of the law firm. So a lot of the preventative work that we did uh, starting in 1990, 91, uh, was out of the law firm. And we quickly realized that on both sides of this equation, both in ministries and in child serving secular organizations, uh, that there was a great need for replicatable resources that people could gain access to, train their staff members, train their volunteers, and um, take a deeper dive into this specific realm, this risk because um, left to their own devices, uh, ministries in particular uh, are tend to be more trusting than they should be. They tend to presume and presuppose that people who want to work for them or volunteer with them always have the right motive. Um, so quickly it became apparent to us just from our litigation practice that um, 
the church, Big C, needed resources and help, um, child serving organizations, and I'd say I see a, a real need on the secular side in sports organizations. Yeah. Um, had need to better understand this risk, how it might manifest in their program, and how to protect against it. Wow. Yeah, I've seen it time and time again. It's not just churches either. It's, I mean, we all typically want to think that everybody has good in them. And so we automatically trust, but you kind of need these tools in, in your back pocket to be able to help prevent all of that. So I absolutely commend you guys for starting all of this. Would you mind explaining a little bit of a difference between ministry safe and abuse prevention systems? Sure. So ministry safe is just what it sounds like. It's the ministry side. So we have a lot of churches, Christian camps, missional organizations, denominations, Christian schools. I mean, think about any Christ-based context or ministry context, and that's kind of under the umbrella of ministry safe. Uh, Abuse prevention systems is the secular side, so girls and boys clubs, YMCAs, um, secular camps, secular programs that are like private schools that are not under a ministry umbrella, Um, zoo schools, museum schools, sports organizations, you know, you name it. Any other context where an organization is serving children or educating children or uh, having children involved in their organizational programming. That's the abuse prevention system side. Okay. I always want to ask everybody what their why is. What led you guys to essentially advocate for those who've been sexually abused or assaulted or groomed? Uh, So I, um, I guess you know this about me. I have a justice thing Mm -hmm. and um, that's essentially why I went to law school. If you'd have told me in law school that I was going to be a sexual abuse expert or sexual abuse advocate, I probably would not have believed you. Um, it's not my experience. It's not, I'm not reliving something or vindicating something. I just had a circumstance very early in my law practice where a individual came in and um, he was working in a children's facility in our city and state, Fort Worth, Texas. And um, he had been fired from his employment in a child serving context because he reported child sexual abuse that had occurred at the hands of another staff member in the past. Yeah. And in our state, you can, we're an at will employment state, you can let someone go because you don't like the way they part their hair, but you cannot fire them for complying with state reporting law. And state reporting law then and now said every adult is a mandatory reporter of child abuse and neglect. So I took his case, it was essentially a whistleblower case, and it was on principle, the damages related to it because his salary was so minimal or nothing, right. but it was offensive. And um, that case morphed into a 30 some odd plaintiff case related to the kids themselves who had been sexually abused. So that was kind of my entree in. And um, I was just shocked and horrified and disgusted that in this case, it was an organization where these children lived. They weren't just participating. They lived there. They went to school there. Um, So that was their home. And I was shocked and horrified that any uh, human being in the name of quote unquote charity would allow that type of behavior and minimize it and sweep it under the rug. And that just hit a whole lot of buttons in me. And that was the beginning that started in 1991. Wow. And it's unfortunate because it still happens to this day. And I'm I'm just glad that you're highlighting that fact right there. Mm -hmm. Within litigation, is there a case that stuck with you since you were made aware of it? Yeah, I'd say when I thought about this, um, it would be that case. I mean, I've been litigating for over three decades now. Um, If I'm actually in the courtroom, it's in a tiny little context. And that's a circumstance where a child has been sexually abused while his or her parents were participating in a cult and the abuser was in spiritual authority over that family. Um, So that's, if I'm in the courtroom today, it's in that context. The case I just kind of daylighted was not in a, uh, that type of setting. Uh, It was in a secular child serving context 
Um, but that case really impacted me. It was about 10 years of my life. Um, I literally put every penny that I had into um, being able to, to see it out through the end. Um, during the course of that case, because the defendant was something of a sacred cow, um, I was vilified by them to my boss. I went, my house, my home was vandalized repeatedly. My office was broken into four times. Um, my nameplate hanging over my car and my parking area was battered repeatedly. It's never happened before or since. So it was a really impactful scenario for me that finally resulted in vindication for those kids and what they had experienced and an apology from the entity. Well, that's a little late, right? Yeah. But, um, you know, they also paid significant damages to provide ongoing care and counseling for those kids. So it was a big deal and it lasted a long time. This won't mean much to your listeners, but my case made Paul Harvey. Oh, wow. We talked about my case and the proverbial rest of the story. Um, so it was a, it was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. It got lots of press, lots of coverage. Uh, wow. Because it was so long ago, and it was one of the first really high-profile cases in this state, in Texas, about child sexual abuse issues. So that was kind of the front end of my litigation career in litigating. I haven't litigated any other type of case since that case other than child sexual abuse. Wow. It's, it's amazing what, what our path will always lead us to, right? Mm -hmm. What are some common misconceptions about child sexual abuse and how do these misconceptions misdirect allowing predators to fly under the radar? Uh, so one of the biggest misconceptions that I encounter, whether it's in ministry or secular context, is the idea of stranger danger. Mm -hmm. And frankly, uh, we come by that concept honestly in that um, the federal government ages ago created some cartoon vignettes that I saw when I was a kid that showed a guy in a trench coat next to the public park with Beanie Babies spilling out of his pocket. And he had a sad puppy on a string, um, kind of reinforcing the idea to parents and to kids that the danger where child sexual abuse is concerned is somewhere outside the fence, you know, and um, typically that's incorrect. 90% of kids who are sexually abused are abused by someone they know and trust. It is not a stranger. So this idea that parents have in their head of that creepy neighbor or that creepy guy or that guy who was staring in the restaurant, could that be a predator? Sure. Right. But 90% of kids who are sexually abused are abused by someone they know and trust. It's not some stranger. And that kind of goes hand in glove with the concept that it's kind of the flip side of that misconception. Um, offenders, almost without exception, they groom kids for sexual interaction, mm -hmm. um, which is a process. But almost as important as understanding that is understanding that molesters groom the gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. So they groom the people through whom they have to go to get access to the kid. So uh, the, the primary gatekeepers are parents. So molesters are going to groom parents, program directors, uh, ministry staff members, the people who are running the program to believe that they're helpful, trustworthy, responsible people. And they do that because what every uh, offender needs uh, to groom a child for sexual interaction is trusted time alone. Yep. And none of us as parents or caring individuals are going to give time alone with our kids to someone that we don't think is trustworthy. So this dovetails into, um, you know, some of the other misconceptions that we hang on to. I'd be able to spot an abuser. I would... I would see something, I would feel something, I would know if this person had the wrong motive related to his or her interaction with my child. And that's just not, not the case. Offenders have no uh, visual profile. They look like you and me. They act like you and me. Uh, and they gravitate to places that are collecting children, providing services to children who are within their age and gender of preference. Right. It's, it's, you know, for lack of a better term, they're almost like a kid in a candy store. And one thing that you taught me that actually has always stuck with me, I don't know if this is verbatim, but you had told me 
Something to the effect of um, just because they're some person in a white van doesn't necessarily mean that they're an offender. Um, like you said, they look just like you and me. They act just like you and me. They they could look like your normal average everyday Joe. Um, they're really good at being, uh, what's the word, camouflaged. Yeah, they fly under the radar. And uh, many uh, offenders who are lifetime offenders, preferential offenders who prefer a child as a sexual partner, spend their lives creating a persona of being charming, helpful, yeah. nice guy, nice gal. And um, again, that's not coincidental. And you know, I use a, I have a, a pick that I use in my live trainings now that it's a white band that's all dented up and all over the side of it, it says free candy and it has children's handprints and paint all over it. And that's what a lot of us think is the danger. Right. Clearly, I don't want my kid getting into that van but at the same time, I've got to be vigilant and understand that the majority of the risk does not come from the guy in the, in the white van. Exactly. I've got to have boundaries and parameters in place um, with my child, who's no longer a child, but uh, that are uh, protective for where the bigger risk tends to manifest. Obviously, you know, you you guys created ministry safe and abuse prevention systems. Um, how has that molded you guys as parents and caregivers? So I was a very uh, proactive parent. Um, I have always been, some of this is just my personality, but I've always been unapologetic about the boundaries that I put in place for my child. I have one child. Um, I unabashedly and unequivocally made my house the fun place to be. Right. And that was intentional. Um, most of the uh, sleepovers, when they started to occur in junior high and beyond, we didn't do that before that point. But when they started to occur, they were at my house. The uh, fun stuff to do was at my house. And that was just, that was just strategy. Because I know what's happening at my house. Yeah. Um, if my child spent the night anyplace else, it was heavily vetted before that occurred and did not occur until she was in late junior high, early high school. And that means not just knowing, I got to know who the parents are. I got to know what other siblings may be in the house. I want to know if the siblings who are in the house, I can't tell you how many phone calls I get about the older brother's friend who came into the eight-year-old's bedroom, that sort of thing. Um, so I just, I, you know, I know what's happening at my house. I don't know what's happening in other locations. And is that, um, what, subjective? Unequivocally, yes. But I cannot afford to be wrong about my child's childhood experience. Right. Um, so some moms have communicated to me. By the way, we have a parent training that I filmed um, a couple years ago with my daughter. Um, that just zeroes in on, you know, as mother-daughter, it was super important that that line of communication be open from the beginning. Yeah. So I started the sexual conversation with my daughter when she was three, four, five years of age in an age-appropriate way. And one of the real compliments, I feel like one of my badges of parenthood is my daughter said, I, I asked you more things, mom, than I Googled. Wow. Because I knew I'd get a straight answer and I knew you wouldn't be embarrassed to tell. And I, I knew that I could get the information that I needed. And I think a lot of parents are hesitant to start and continue that conversation. Information is power for yeah. our children. Yes, it and is. Arming them with good information from the get go, not in a scary way. I mean, things like somebody touches you where your bathing suit covers, mama needs to know. And um, is it always evil or nefarious? No, but I need to know because my I'm the primary gatekeeper to my own child and it is my responsibility to protect her until when or if she has the bandwidth, the size, the age, the wisdom, the understanding to protect herself. I was over the top proactive and occasionally I got a little bit of, wow, why do you, I mean, why do you have to be so, I'm, I asked my daughter years later, do you think I was a helicopter mom? And she said, well, only in the best ways possible. Right. Only in the sense that I knew I could go to you. And, um, you know, 
same song, eighth verse to parents, don't be the drop off mom. Right. Don't be the drop off dad. Show up, yeah. you know, volunteer, be a part of it. Drop in at various times. Do not assume that if your kid is not precisely where they're supposed to be or in your presence, that you need to know what's going on in their lives. You need to be very present and you need to go really slowly to allow any other adult other than you and your spouse to have one-to-one -one interaction with your kid. And to me, that included relatives, that included grandparents, that included extended family. I just figured I don't, I don't, there's not a lot of room for error to get this right. I am so glad you brought that up. And speaking of the helicopter parent term that that's being used, um, mm -hmm. I always tell people don't apologize if you are a helicopter parent, because there's worse things out there, right? Well, and I think that part of this also includes appropriate communication to our kids. Mm -hmm. um, I'm in charge. You are not. Imagine that. Um, this cell phone that you carry around with you, I own it and I will periodically review its content. So love you mean it, but have no expectation of privacy on this device because I will periodically take a look and see what's going on. Um, having protective and preventative on your computers, on your cell devices. You know, I found some circumstances where my daughter had some really dicey content on her phone, but she didn't recognize what it was. Yeah. Like she was sheltered enough that she had some communication from a guy at, you know, from a Christ based context that was really over the edge, but she didn't know what it meant. Right. So, you know, part of it is us being proactive on our children's behalf um, as well. She could tell her friends, Hey guys, please be aware that periodically my mom looks at my phone. So it was almost like a prophylactic for her, you know, don't send me stuff that you don't want daylighted because periodically my mom looks at my phone. Um, so I, I think the idea that when we're, when we apologize for protecting our kids, we are assuming that what other parents are doing or think about how we manage uh, our interaction with our own child or protection of our own child, we're assuming that either my kid's opinion has more merit than what I believe to be appropriate as the parent or that those other parents' opinions have more weight than what I believe to be appropriate as a parent. And that's just not, you know, that sadly, as my daughter got older, um, we began to be aware of more and more and more situations, in part because of what I do for a living, but where precious little friends had been sexually abused by a grandfather, by brother's older friend who was visiting the home by an uncle who's visiting the home in one case by an older sister who had come back from some context visiting the home and so just watching all these precious little girls and boys I mean it's one in four girls one in six boys and that skips no paradigm it is across the board so watching these precious kids who my girl grew up with and understanding after the fact, wow. So a lot, a lot of what I'm seeing now makes sense because now understanding what happened uh, in that backstory. So yeah, don't apologize for protecting your kid. One day they'll thank you for it. Yes. Yes, they will. Going into the trainings, can you explain the differences between different trainings for our listeners? Because they might not know. And which would you recommend for groups? Which would you recommend for individuals such as parents and guardians, etc.? Yeah, so we have a kajillion different plank trainings currently. The ones that are uh, that I'll uh, highlight here, um, sexual abuse awareness training. So there's a ministry specific version. There is a secular version. And it's kind of the foundational baseline training. It addresses the common misconceptions that people hold on to. Um, it addresses the fact-driven data that we know from academic studies. Um, it just walks through the grooming process of the offender, how abusers um, gain access to kids, how they target specific kids, which specific kids are more likely to be targeted than others what sort of characteristics play into that, um, how the molester introduces nudity and sexual touch, and then once that has occurred, keeps the child silent. 
Um, it addresses the most common grooming behaviors that you might see. <laughs> Here's the good news. Parts of the grooming process are visible. And since it's visible, it's to some extent preventable because some aspects of it are visible. So um, if you are very present in your child's life, you're gonna see some things that may fall into these categories, in which case you should at least consider it might be this, but it could be that. So have a category for that type of behavior that otherwise you might not have. Awareness training addresses reporting requirements and awareness training is kind of for anyone. Right. Um, groups do it, ministries do it, sports organizations do it, the U.S. Olympic Committee does it. I mean, it's like the foundational information for anyone. A training that is more specific that I filmed about two and a half years ago is parent guardian training. And that's aimed at parents it's a slightly kinder and gentler version of me uh, speaking as a mom rather than having my lawyer hat on. I'm incapable of taking my lawyer hat off, frankly, <laughs> um, but it's a discussion to parents. Here's how to have those conversations and, you, you know, start early. If you wait, it's too late. Um, it is, you got to start those conversations early, have the lines of communication open. Here's how you might consider starting the that conversation. Um, it is a description of the grooming process. It talks through, here's how you might, what you might see in your own child. Uh, as a, for instance, if your child has stuff or is doing things that you didn't pay for and you didn't authorize, and they're vague about where it's coming from, start asking the questions. It's a very common grooming behavior for molesters to give kids stuff, give them access to things they want to do. Um, you're my favorite. I can't do this for everyone. So on and so forth. Right. Um, so it talks through the grooming process, common grooming behaviors, what parents might see, some you know categories of their child's uh, interaction with the world that they ought to be proactive about, like technology. Yeah. Um, so that's one that is specifically aimed at parents or guardians. The tail end of that training is a very frank conversation. It was scripted, but unrehearsed. So what you see on that training was take one between me and her talking through some specific, you know, Q and A, how did you encounter this in, in your life? Um, and it's, it's somewhat raw and really effective in my opinion. And so that's when I would encourage parents and guardians to take a look at uh, skillful screening training is aimed more at organizations. So this is premised on 30 now, 40 some odd years of offender studies, um, looking at the characteristics of male and female offenders and training organizations how to screen effectively. I mean, we know a whole lot about offender behavior at this yeah. point. Like 98% of convicted offenders participate in offender studies because if they don't, they can't get probation. And that's a really strong motivator. So they participate. They're given all kinds of assurances of non-prosecution. We've got all kinds of information that's been gathered. And there's an awful lot of predatory behavior or characteristics that can be spotted, risk indicators. Uh, so that training is aimed at those folk. Um, we have a number of other trainings on the front facing side that are aimed at equipping organizations to put a safety system in place. So have an adequate safety system that is aimed at preventing child sexual abuse and conversely responding appropriately. In the last couple of years, Courtney, we've added in an affiliation with an entity that has uh, put together the Fearless series and that is uh, pieces of um, studies and writings are aimed at abuse survivors. Wow. There's a series for women. There's a series for men. So that's on the ministry safe side because it is Christ based. Um, it's called the fearless series for men and women, separate tracks. Um, and really have seen some great, we partnered with them, but we have no direct affiliation with them. We just think the materials are really good. Yeah. And so that's some, uh, access to some resources for those who've already experienced uh, sexual abuse. So those are the baseline trainings uh, that we've offered. Again, there are many, many others that are aimed at 
child serving organizations and um, ministry organizations that are meant to equip those organizations to put a safety system in place. Love that. And the Fearless series, that sounds amazing. Sure. We can direct our listeners to go visit. I think that all of these trainings are important. They kind of touch on each and every different, I guess, avenue. So you've Mm -hmm. got the organization, you've got the parents and caregivers, and then you've got things for, you know, survivors. So I love this. This is all advocacy and we always tell people we i actually learned this recently and i love it but there's a there's a term called engage with empathy and Mm -hmm. i just love that your organization does just that are there any success stories that you'd be willing to share uh sure so um i think one of the aspects to this that has really been encouraging to me Mm -hmm. We trained our, on the ministry side, we trained our three millionth trainee about six months ago. We're currently training 86,000 ministry staff members per month. And the secular side is pretty close to that on the monthly training volume. I am really encouraged that, you know, back in the day, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, I'd be on the phone giving legal advice to individuals who oversee uh, either a ministry or an organization that serves children. And I I would encounter um, resistance to responding appropriately, supporting the victim. You know, one of the um, misconceptions that we didn't talk about is the idea of false allegations, Mm. Uh, the idea that people are out there just making this stuff up. Um, which even saying that out loud makes me angry. We know statistically that false allegations are rare. They mm-hmm. are two to five percent of the whole. For the most part, when a kid said it happened, it actually happened. Yep. In some circumstances, even when there's a recant, it's the kid's attempt to put the toothpaste back in the tube because yeah. of pressure from the family or somebody else. Um, but uh, false allegations are rare, and I'm fine. I'm encouraged by the fact that when I'm talking to ministry leaders across the United States, I no longer encounter some of the same misconceptions or resistance. And uh, I would say 20 years ago, when we got the phone call, it was because someone was in crisis and their hair was on fire. So they were being reactive. And a lot of the calls currently are being more proactive rather than reactive. And I think that's a success story by itself But I guess one of the uh, places where I feel, you know, I just, uh, I love what I get to do. I'm one of the few lawyers you will ever encounter who knows I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, And I am privileged to work in in a realm that uses my skills and abilities, but also makes a difference. Um, And I get emails from people from abuse survivors saying, I watched the training. I wish this had been in place at my church. I wish this had, I wish my parents could have seen this parent training that I just viewed in order to be better equipped to navigate this issue with my child. Um, so that's, those are bittersweet, but mostly I get a lot of emails from people saying, thank you. Thank you for acknowledging this. Thank you for bringing this out of the closet. Thank you that my church feels committed to have me as a volunteer take this training. Thank you that my sports organization that you know, where I serve as an assistant coach for a football team thinks that it's important that this information be in my hands as a volunteer coach. So um, that's, that's a success story because the more awareness that exists about this issue, the more we take this whole subject matter out of the proverbial closet. And when you think about it, one in four women, one in six men, if that was the past experience of that high a percentage of our population, when you add into that those that are married to those who were victimized, or those who are a parent to a victimized child, or those who have a brother or sister who is victimized uh, as a child, you know, that's arguably 100% of the population as a whole. Yeah. So turning the light on, daylighting this subject matter is super encouraging to me. And, you know, the success stories are in when organizations do this better, when parents understand it better, when individuals who are concerned about the safety or welfare of 
the children they care about understand this better, um, our kids are safer. And that's a success story. Well, you are definitely changing narratives and changing lives. So thank you so much once again for joining me. Um, would you mind letting our listeners know um, where they can find you, like social media and websites, or how they can reach you should they need you? Sure. The easiest way is to just go to ministrysafe.com or abusepreventionsystems.com. That's the easiest way in. There's intake there for getting additional information. There's intake there for uh, getting information about the services that we provide. So that would be my recommendation. I don't do a ton of social media in part because... Um, I don't know. It just sometimes it can feel like can feel like a black hole sometimes. Yeah. yeah. So what what can go on there? But uh, it's got value and it's a way of communicating that is effective. So here we are connecting on it currently. <laughs> uh, but the best way to reach us is through ministrysafe.com or abusepreventionsystems.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again. I really appreciated you joining me, and I am so glad that we finally got an interview. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm glad to have had the opportunity to reconnect. Thank you once again for joining us for this episode, Kim, and we hope to work with you again in the future. To our listeners, please reference the show notes if you're interested in any of the trainings mentioned in today's episode. If you don't know where to start, you can head over to ministrysafe.com and go from there. We always end with this, but... A gentle reminder that victims and survivors are bees. Bees are strong, resilient, yet vulnerable. We must protect the bees at all cost. And that includes necessary trainings mentioned in today's episode to have in your tool belt. If we do not protect the bees, we will not survive and thrive in this life. So be vigilant for when you mess with the bees, you get the hive. Thank you for listening to A Nefarious Nightmare. The music used in the theme was originally by Ghost Stories Incorporated, remixed by Ryan RCX Murphy. Additional background music is provided by Epidemic Sound. A Nefarious Nightmare is scripted, researched, and produced by Courtney Fenner and Amanda Cronin. I'm Lainey Hobbs, and as always, be vigilant. For when you mess with the bees, you get the hive. The hive.